Ne te quasi veris extra. Man is his own star, and the soul that can render an honest and a perfect man commands all light, all influence, all fate. Nothing to him falls early or too late. Our acts our angels are, or good or ill, our fatal shadows that walk by us still. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality but little by little he looks at his watch but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall now we'll try it once again here's the candid subject here comes the candid camera staff three of them at least and uh, this man has apparently been in groups before with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. There is, notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. In 1935, in his study of social influences, Sheriff made use of a phenomenon called the autokinetic effect. This is where a stationary point of light in a completely dark room will appear to move. This happens because the eye makes tiny involuntary movements all the time. In a well-lit room with clear reference points, our brain compensates for these involuntary movements so that the world appears stationary. But in a totally dark room, we've got no frame of reference to tell our brain whether it's our eye that moved or the point of light. Sheriff asked individual subjects to estimate how far the point of light moved. When asked individually, the range of answers given was pretty broad. Some consistently reported that the light moved around 6 inches, others consistently reported that it barely moved at all. But when asked as a group, subjects' answers converged towards an average distance. Subjects rejected the idea that they'd been influenced by the group, but went on in subsequent individual tests to give answers consistently close to their group norm. Sheriff's experiment was criticised for using an ambiguous task. Not knowing for sure how far the light moved, subjects were more prone to change their minds. But what would happen if the task wasn't ambiguous? In the 1950s, Ash addressed this question using very concrete stimuli. He assembled groups of seven to nine college students in a classroom for an experiment ostensibly about visual judgment. He then presented a series of cards like this. Going round the group, Participants then had to identify which of the lines on the right matched the line on the left. The twist was that in reality, all the participants except one were confederates of Ash, who had secretly been instructed to give the wrong answer on 12 out of 18 sets of cards, starting with the third set. Ash tested 123 subjects. In normal circumstances, subjects gave incorrect answers less than 1% of the time. With the social pressure of the confederates applied, that shot up to an incidence of around 37%, with 74% of subjects conforming to the majority on at least one critical trial. Subjects didn't necessarily conform straight away. Some started out defying the group for a couple of rounds. 
but became gradually more hesitant and quiet before conformity eventually kicked in. Ash proposed that conformity could be explained by distortions occurring at any of three levels perception, judgment and action. At the action level, subjects believe the majority are wrong, but go along with them anyway. At the level of judgment, subjects perceive there is a conflict, but reject their own judgment, concluding the majority are right. At the level of perception, subjects' perceptions are genuinely distorted by the majority answers. A recent neurological study by Burns and colleagues investigated these three explanations, using magnetic resonance imaging to examine the brain activity involved in this social phenomenon. 32 subjects were tested in all, and this time the task involved mentally rotating two 3D objects to decide whether or not they matched. As with Ash's experiments, the rest of the group were confederates instructed to give predetermined right or wrong answers. Consistent with Ash's findings, subjects on average conform 41% of the time. But of course, the main thrust of this experiment was to see what parts of the brain were associated with this conformity. If conformity occurred at the level of perception, Areas like the occipital and parietal lobes used in visual spatial awareness would be expected to show activity. If it occurred at the level of judgment and action, other areas would be predicted, such as the orbitofrontal cortex used in decision making. The MRI scans showed activity in the occipital parietal network, supporting the perception explanation. If it's true that subjects' perceptions are genuinely distorted, that means that group opinion has the potential to affect an individual's information processing on a very profound level. Now I'd suggest it's not possible to generalise these results back to Ash's subjects. I'd suggest there's a substantial difference in difficulty between the two tasks, so that with the rotation task, subjects might well be more prone to rely on other people's judgments. To be sure the same brain processes are at work in Ash's experiment, subjects would have to be tested doing his single line task. And even though the perception explanation was supported here, we know that the other two processes do exist. We can all think of instances in our lives when we've knowingly gone along with the majority despite private reservations or preferences. There are loads of human mechanisms that can work for us or against us. Our pattern-seeking behaviours led to all kinds of scientific breakthroughs where we've correctly identified valid patterns in nature. It's also given rise to all kinds of irrational superstitions where we've imagined patterns and relationships that have no basis in reality. Clearly, conformity can have its advantages. It can give social life a convenient structure, predictability. It allows us to maintain all sorts of helpful social conventions like queuing, without the hassle of constant challenge and renegotiation. But it begins to work against us when we allow ourselves to be tyrannised by group opinion in areas where group opinion simply shouldn't figure. We can end up distorting huge chunks of our authentic selves for absolutely no good reason. Chunks of autonomy, personal desires and preferences that have no impact on others, valid objections on important issues. It's my contention that we give up a lot more than we know. Pressure to conform is pervasive and insidious. We often feel liberated when we break away from a majority who we realise we've been subscribing to purely because of social pressures to conform. We form minority communities that seem to represent freedom from those pressures. We then find that these minority communities can become rife with exactly the same pressures to conform to them. In a 2007 study into how we assess group opinion, Weaver and colleagues found that hearing an opinion repeated three times by the same person in a group had almost exactly the same impact as hearing the same opinion expressed by three different people in a group. Weaver argues that we assess an opinion's popularity by how familiar it is to us, how many times we've heard it, and unfortunately our brains don't always distinguish between an opinion expressed by many individuals and an opinion merely repeated by the same few. We can be self-defeating in our conformity. Say we have a group of people holding opinion X. Unbeknownst to the group, half of them secretly disagree, but due to the social penalties they've seen dished out to a few individuals who have disagreed, they keep quiet. By conforming, we add to the statistics of groups we don't actually belong to, and perpetuate the idea of majorities who may not actually exist. Imagine if none of us conformed in that way, how that would change the social landscape. Uh, they live a lot along here, and they're mostly, they're not um, working class people. They are people who dropped out of college because they saw it was stupid. 
And they're that sort of people. We would call them perhaps beatniks. Uh, but you see, the city doesn't like it because they aren't owning the right sort of cars and therefore the local car salesman isn't doing business through them. Uh, they don't have lawns and so nobody can sell them lawn mowers. They hardly uh, use dishwashers, appliances of that kind. They don't need them. And also they wear blue jeans and uh, things like that and so the local dress shops feel a bit put out having these people around. And they are very, they live very simply. Well, they, you, you mustn't do that. You've got to live in a complicated way. You've got to have the, the kind of car, you know, that identifies you as a person of substance and status and all that. So there's a great problem here in our society. Now, why is there this problem? There's always a very inconsiderable minority of these non-joiners or people who check out of the game. But you will find that insecure societies are the most intolerant of those who are non-joiners. They are so unsure of the validity of their game rules that they say everyone must play. Now that's a double bind. You can't say to a person, you must play. Because what you're saying is, you are required to do something which will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. <laughs> you see? So everyone must play is the rule in the United States. And it's the rule in um, almost all Republican governments. I mean Republican in the sense of uh, de Democratic. <laughs> because they're very uneasy. Because everybody is responsible. You mean you may try not to be and avoid it and say, oh, let the senators take care of it or the president. But theoretically, everyone's responsible. Now, that's terrifying. See, it's all right when you know what's right. There is an aristocracy, there is the clergy, and they know what should be done, and they're used to ruling, you see. But now it's, it's in your hands. You say, well, what are, what are we going to do? Well, I think this way, and you think that way, and he thinks the other way. And so we're all unsettled. And therefore, we become more and more conformist. Individualism, rugged individualism, always leads to conformism. Because people get scared. And so they herd together, and it compounded with industrial society, mass production, etc. They all wear the same clothes. And they're sensible clothes that don't show the dirt too much. And that kind of society, watch out for it. It turns in a quick click into fascism because of its terror of the outsider. Now a free and easy society loves outsiders. In fact it's a little bad for the outsider's integrity because he becomes a uh, holy man, see? And uh, people make uh, salams and uh, give him food and uh, all that. They really take care of the outsider because they know that man is doing for us what we haven't got the guts to do. That outsider who lives up there in the mountain is at the highest peak of human evolution. His consciousness is one with the divine. And great, just there is someone like that around. It makes you feel a little better. He is realized. He knows what it's all about. And so we need a number of those people. Even though they don't join our game, they tell us, you see, what you're doing is only a game. It's okay, I'm not going to condemn you, but it is only a game, and we up on that mountaintop are watching you. We love you, we have compassion for you, and, uh, but excuse please, we aren't going to join. <laughs> so that gives the community great strength, because it tells the government, in no uncertain terms, that there's something more than government. Just knowing about Ash's experiment makes us less susceptible as potential subjects in similar experiments. The more aware we are of our vulnerabilities to conform on any level, 
the better we're able to defend against it. It's easier to be sceptical towards groups we don't belong to or that we've broken away from, but conformity really kicks in in the groups we identify with. To get the support and acceptance we might seek from those groups, we can find ourselves giving up more than we bargained for in return. Being part of a group doesn't mean agreeing with every part of that group. We should always feel able to voice legitimate criticisms with any group, whether that's family, friends, social interest groups, whoever. When we stop feeling able to do that, we give those groups a status and authority that they don't deserve and that they actually don't possess. If a group can't handle legitimate dissent, it's not a group I want to be part of. Thinking is the first step. Doing is the next. We have built our education systems on the model of fast food. This is something Jamie Oliver talked about the other day. You know, there are two models of quality assurance in catering. One is fast food, where everything is standardized. The other are things like Zagat and Michelin restaurants, where everything is not standardized. They're customized to local circumstances. And we have sold ourselves into a fast food model of education. And it's impoverishing our spirits and our energies as much as fast food is depleting our physical bodies. I think we have to recognize a couple of things here. One is that human talent is tremendously diverse. People have very different aptitudes. <laughs> but it's not only about that, it's about passion. Often people are good at things they don't really care for. It's about passion and what excites our spirit and our energy. And if you're doing the thing that you love to do, that you're good at, time takes a different course entirely. And the reason so many people are opting out of education is because it doesn't feed their spirit. It doesn't feed their energy or their passion. So I think we have to change metaphors. We have to go from what is essentially an industrial model of education, a manufacturing model, which is based on linearity and conformity and batching people. We have to move to a model that is based more on principles of agriculture. We have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process, it's an organic process. And you cannot predict the outcome of human development. All you can do is, like a farmer, is create the conditions under which they will begin to flourish. So when we look at reforming education and transforming it, it isn't like cloning a system. There are great ones, like KIPS, it's a great system. There are many great um, models. It's about customizing them to your circumstances and personalizing education to the people that you're actually teaching. And doing that, I think, is the answer to the future, because it's not about scaling a new solution. It's about creating a movement in education in which people develop their own solutions, but with external support based on a personalized curriculum. Now, in this room, there are people who represent extraordinary resources in business, in multimedia, uh, in the internet. These technologies, combined with extraordinary talents of teachers, provide an opportunity to revolutionize education. And I urge you to get involved in it because it's vital not just to ourselves, but to the future of our children. But we have to change from the industrial model to an agricultural model where each school can be flourishing tomorrow. Familiar as the voice of the mind is to each, the highest merit we ascribe to Moses, Plato, and Milton is that they set at naught books and traditions, and spoke not what men, but what they thought. A man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his.